Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. My name is Rod Hemmer. And I'm Janice. This is Quick Study Television, a television program, of course, designed to take you through the Bible. It is an excellent read as we go through the 66 books written by 40 authors over thousands of years. Someone here to help us discover what we're doing is Corey. Corey, what's up? Well, in our reading today, the nation of Judah faces an Assyrian invasion. So we're going to be focusing on that historical event today. Excellent. Very good. Mm -hmm. You studied what? Yes. Well, today we're going to be talking about Isaiah 38, comparing Hezekiah to his father Ahaz. Very interesting. That is fascinating. Okay, Ryan, what in the world are you doing? Today I'm looking at the life of one of God's greatest kings, Hezekiah. All right, very good. Today we're talking about Hezekiah and his death. I mean, the prophet tells him, according to God, he says, tell him Hezekiah is going to die. Hezekiah reacts. And we'll talk about Hezekiah's death in just a moment. Stay there. Prophet Isaiah records uh, some history here in his book. Uh, Isaiah talks about uh, this invasion of Assyria as they come into Judah. And this happens during the reign of Judah's king Hezekiah, who's of course ruling from Jerusalem. And some of the interactions between Isaiah and Hezekiah are recorded here. Let's focus in on this Assyrian invasion. The Assyrian destruction of Lake Kish is one of the most uniquely established events in ancient history. It is verified by the Bible, Assyrian carvings depicting the destruction, and the archaeology of Lake Kish itself. Lake Kish was a prominent city in the time period of the kings of Judah, second in importance only to the capital city of Jerusalem. It's located 25 miles southwest of Jerusalem and to this day towers over the surrounding landscape built on a tell, a raised summit that in this case is around 18 acres on top. During the reign of King Hezekiah of Judah and the lifetime of the prophet Isaiah, the nation of Assyria attacked, captured, and demolished Lachish. The archeology span of the site paints a vivid picture, which is of course emphasized by the actual ancient pictures carved by an Assyrian artist. Not only has a complete fiery destruction level been found at Lachish, but also the remains of an Assyrian siege ramp, scales of Assyrian armor, remains of firebrands, and many iron arrowheads and sling stones used by the conquering army. Interestingly, the careful excavations have also revealed some countermeasures used by the besieged Judeans. Large stones with holes carved through them are believed by archaeologists to have been swung from ropes over the city wall in attempts to dismantle the siege engines battering the wall and cause confusion among the Assyrian soldiers. A section of large chain has also been found that is believed to have been thrown over the wall to lie on the ground, the idea being to pull the chain back up once the siege engines had rolled on top of them. That the battle was terrible is witnessed to by the destroyed walls and homes of the site, whose collapsed walls served as an effective tomb for the day-to-day -day goods of these people. A people whose fate was either death by the army, one mass grave of over 1,500 ancient bodies was found, or deportation to another part of the Assyrian Empire. Now, the reason that Sennacherib uh, chose Lachish as his uh, place of stand is because it was such a prominent city uh, in Judah. Uh, so next to Jerusalem, it was prime in importance for defensive purposes. So there was a few cities uh, that are mentioned uh, throughout Kings and Chronicles uh, that were defensive cities, military cities of Judah. Uh, and Lachish is definitely uh, a top priority when it comes to the kings of Israel and we see this because they constantly are rebuilding it. For example, uh, the next book of a prophet that we're going to be studying on, on quick study is, of course, the book of the prophet Jeremiah. And in Jeremiah's day, he's a few kings later on down the list, but by his day, Lachish has been rebuilt as a military city. It was of key importance. It was a last line of defense uh, before any invading army would come to Jerusalem. All invading armies needed to pass through Lachish first. So they rebuilt 
built Lachish as a defensive um, uh, structure for the city of Jerusalem, and then it was, again, destroyed later on in the Babylonian invasion. Um, but it served as normally a pretty good protect protection for Jerusalem. So uh, the fact that we see Sennacherib camping out here at Lachish, using it as his home base, is not altogether surprising. Uh, and actually, on tomorrow's show, if you tune back in, you and I are going to be focusing in on the Lachish reliefs. So these are records of Sennacherib specifically about this battle. The scriptures provide historical information, especially about the Jewish people. Now, the Bible speaks of one interesting king, Hezekiah, who consistently dabbled in both great and horrible things and knew the God of his father, David, the standard for all kings until the king of kings appeared in a small village in Bethlehem about 4 BC. Hezekiah's health declined. God began to prepare him for death. Hezekiah did not want to be prepared. He cried out to God, reminding of the divine things that he had done in his life. It is an amazing move, and as a sign to the king, the king Hezekiah, that he would live another 15 years, God moved the sundial back 10 degrees. This event changed history and the way the entire planet rotates. Isaiah 38, verses 1 through 12 and 19 through 20. In those days, Hezekiah was sick and near death. And Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amos, went to him and said to him, Thus says the Lord, Set your house in order, for you shall die and not live. Then Hezekiah turned his face toward the wall and prayed to the Lord and said, Remember now, O Lord, I pray, how I have walked before you in truth and with a loyal heart and have done what is good in your sight. And Hezekiah wept bitterly. And the word of the Lord came to Isaiah, saying, Go and tell Hezekiah, thus says the Lord, the God of David your father, I have heard your prayer, I have seen your tears. Surely I will add to your days fifteen years. I will deliver you and this city from the hand of the king of Assyria, and I will defend this city. And this is the sign to you from the Lord, that the Lord will do this thing which he has spoken. Behold, I will bring the shadow on the sundial which has gone down with the sun on the sundial of Ahaz ten degrees backward. So the sun returned ten degrees on the dial by which it had gone down. This is the writing of Hezekiah, king of Judah, when he had been sick and had recovered from his sickness. I said, In the prime of my life, I shall go to the gates of Sheol. I am deprived of the remainder of my years. I said, I shall not see Yah, the Lord, in the land of the living. I shall observe man no more among the inhabitants of the world. My lifespan is gone, taken from me like a shepherd's tent. I have cut off my life like a weaver. He cuts me off from the loom. From day until night you make an end of me. Verse 19. The living, the living man, he shall praise you as I do this day. The Father shall make known your truth to the children. The Lord was ready to save me. Therefore we will sing my songs with stringed instruments all the days of our life in the house of the Lord. Isaiah chapter 38, verses 1 through 12 and 19 through 20. As we get ready for Hezekiah's death, we are faced with the fact that Isaiah is involved with it. This is from Isaiah's prophecy. And King Hezekiah is not really ready for death. We've read that already. And 
It is absolutely amazing what God has done in this particular passage. And Isaiah goes to leave and God says, you know, turn around and go back because we've got to deal with this. And so that's what he did. Get your Bible out and your Bible guide as we study through it. If you don't have it, write to one of the three addresses on the screen, or you can go to www.biblediscoverytv.com. And when you go there, make sure that you click on donate here, make a donation in any amount. We'll be happy to send you the Bible guide every single month. Now, when we look at this, it's important for us to realize works of faith. Hezekiah's death is delayed. And so this is a fascinating passage because we read Isaiah 37 to 39. We're looking at Isaiah chapter 38, verses 1 to 12, and then verses 19 to 20. And as we consider this, I want you to think about Hezekiah because he is a king who is not really of uh, any particular passage of evil. And he's a good king. He's made some mistakes and he's coming to the end of his life. And he says to God, I don't want to die. Remember the divine things that I have done. And God does remember. Now that's fascinating. Let's look at this. Isaiah chapter 38 verses one to three says, in those days, Hezekiah was sick and near death. And Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amoz, went to him and said to him, what Isaiah said, thus says the Lord, set your house in order, for you shall die and not live. That's what Hezekiah said, or Isaiah said to him. Then Hezekiah turned his face towards the wall and he prayed to the Lord and he said, remember now, O Lord, I pray. Remember now, I pray, how I have walked before you in truth and with a loyal heart, and have done what is good in your sight. And Hezekiah wept bitterly. Now, as I look at this, there's no question that we got to, got to really understand what God hears. See, when God, when we pray, God hears our prayers. And especially, I need you to remember this. Remember, even when it seems God is ignoring us, he hears our cries. I think this is fascinating. Remember that, that Hezekiah knows God. And God came to him and said, now, Hezekiah, you got to get your house in order because it's time for you to come home. Uh, you're going to die. Now, Hezekiah doesn't truly understand death. He doesn't understand what's beyond death. He doesn't really get it. But God says that to him and he becomes panicky and he says, Lord, I, I can't die. I deserve 15 more years. Help me. And you know, God gives him that time. And that is absolutely amazing. Because of his weeping, because of his crying, God gave him the time. That's amazing. All right, we got to go on because this is absolutely stunning. Isaiah chapter 38, verse 4 says, And the word of the Lord came to Isaiah. I love this part. Saying, Go and tell Hezekiah, Thus says the Lord, the God of David your father, I have heard your prayer. I have seen your tears. Surely I will add to your days 15 years. I will deliver you and this city from the hand of King Hezekiah, or King, uh, rather, of the Assyria, King of Assyria, and I will defend the city. And this is the sign to you from the Lord that the Lord will do this thing which he has spoken. Behold, I will bring the shadow on the sundial, which has gone down with the sun on the sundial of Ahaz, 10 degrees backward. I'll make it go backwards. So the sun returned 10 degrees on the dial by which he had gone down. Now, this is amazing. Think of this. This is the sundial going backwards. And as we look at this, we need to understand God can redirect his plans to accommodate our cries. God can redirect his plans to accommodate our cries. We must be ready. Now, people say to me, well, if God already knows what he's going to do, if God knows everything, he knows what he's going to do. And 
But think about this. God has foreknowledge. So God knew that Hezekiah would cry and ask for the time. And so God set the motion in place and he's got it all in control. The Lord knows, beloved. The Lord understands what we're going through. He hears our cry. He realizes that we, of course, don't know what's beyond this life, except for what the Bible tells us, and that is heaven. And so we have to understand that God understands what we're thinking. Now, that's very important, very important. We go on in the scripture and listen to this. Isaiah chapter 38, 9 to 12 and 19 to 20. Listen, 9 says, this is the writing of Hezekiah, king of Judah, when he had been sick and had recovered from his sickness. I said, in the prime of my life, I shall go to the gates of Sheol or death. And I am deprived of the remainder of my years. I said, I shall not see Yah or God, the Lord in his land of the living. I shall observe man no more among the inhabitants of the world. My lifespan is gone, taken from me like a shepherd's tent. And I have cut off my life like a weaver. He cuts me off from the loom. From day until night, you make an end of me. And then we skip down to verse 19 and it says, the living, the living man, he shall praise you as I do this day. The father shall make known your truth to the children. The Lord was ready to save me. Therefore, we will sing my songs with stringed instruments all the days of our life in the house of the Lord. This is the way that Isaiah spends praising God. Beloved, we must praise God, not only for those, or not only for who he is, but for what he has done. God changes things, not us. I like to remind people of this. When you are working and when you're thinking, keep in mind that you have the ability to breathe and think because God gave it to you. So everything you do, all that you do is from God. Now, Hezekiah was forced with the reality of his death. God decided to let him go through that. As he went through that, he understood God would hear him and God knew what he was going to do. And so, beloved, this is the relationship between Hezekiah and God that he was showing us in the Bible. Next time on Quick Study Television, we're going to be talking about the end of time. Time comes to an end, believe it or not, it has a beginning and an end. And we'll talk about all of that and more next time on Quick Study Television. So make sure you make time to join us. Right now, here's Ryan. Well, in our reading, we're in the book of the prophet Isaiah. And one of the people Isaiah ministered to was King Hezekiah. Now, this Judean king was one of the rare righteous kings during this time period. And God delivered him from his troubles. The Bible describes King Hezekiah as one who trusted in the Lord God of Israel, so that after him was none like him among all the kings of Judah, nor who were before him. This was perhaps surprising since Hezekiah's father Ahaz was one of the worst kings Israel had ever seen, as he sacrificed to false gods on the high places, erected his own pagan altar in the house of the Lord, and even passed his own son through the fire as a sacrifice. Yet Hezekiah's first act as king was the cleansing of the temple. He also tore down all the high places and re-established worship to the one true God. He even went so far as to destroy the more than 700-year-old bronze serpent, 
which Moses had made and which the people were now burning incense to. At the time of Hezekiah's ascent, the Jews were being threatened with extinction by the Assyrian Empire, and they were now looking to this 25-year-old Judean king for deliverance. The northern Jewish nation of Israel had already fallen, and the southern nation of Judah was now doomed to follow. Indeed, 46 walled cities of Judah fell, one by one, until only Jerusalem was left. However, Hezekiah, desiring to free his people, reinforced and even built a secondary inside wall around Jerusalem. He also stockpiled weapons and food, and built a tunnel, now known famously as Hezekiah's Tunnel, which connected to a hidden spring so the people inside the city would have water. He even plugged and hid other springs which surrounded Jerusalem so that the invaders could not use them. Soon, Jerusalem found itself surrounded by the Assyrians, and in a letter to Hezekiah, the Assyrian king Sennacherib boasts of his other military victories and claims that just as the gods of those nations did not deliver them from his hand, neither will the God of Israel deliver Jerusalem. Hezekiah immediately spreads out the letter before God and pleads with him for deliverance. Because of Hezekiah's love and commitment to God, the Lord promises Hezekiah deliverance. Indeed, in a single night, God smites 185,000 Assyrian troops, and Sennacherib is later murdered by two of his own sons. Although this was a tremendous victory, Hezekiah soon falls ill, and Isaiah informs him that he is going to die. Though Hezekiah is utterly devastated, he once again entreats the Lord. And before Isaiah has even left the palace, God answers Hezekiah's prayer and extends his life 15 years, and confirms this promise with the sign of the shadow of the sun moving backwards 10 degrees on the sundial of Ahaz. Although Hezekiah would soon develop a prideful heart, he later humbled himself. Although not perfect, Hezekiah is still regarded as one of the most godly kings of Israel and had a prosperous 29-year reign from 715 to 687 BC. What I love about Hezekiah is that he always took things back to the Lord. When Sennacherib threatened him and made many great boasts against God, Hezekiah spread out the letter before the Lord and the Lord answered his prayers. And when God told the king through the prophet Isaiah that he was going to die, Hezekiah prayed to the Lord for life and God granted him his request for life. Hezekiah was a faithful hero and like him, we need to also bring everything before the Lord because he will defend us and fight our battles. Maybe you've received a bad report from the doctor or maybe you're dealing with financial issues. Well, whatever it is, just bring it before the Lord. He will fight for you and defend you. Well, he will, Ryan. And the interesting thing is that Hezekiah talked about that, but he also talked about things he shouldn't have talked about. You right, know, for yeah. example, after he was healed in his life, uh, the Babylonians came mm -hmm. and he showed them everything. everything. Yeah. Well, can you imagine <laughs> Isaiah's, I mean, he just was like, what did you do? Exactly. You know? But you know, exactly. in Hezekiah's defense, because I'm, I'm a big fan Hezekiah's of Hezekiah. Defense. I like him too. In, yeah. in Hezekiah, in his defense, you guys, it did make a lot of political sense because Babylon wasn't Babylon yet. It wasn't what we think of as Babylon. And um, uh, Hezekiah had just come through a major invasion where God all but destroyed Judah. Mm. The only thing that was left was Jerusalem and Hezekiah. Uh, so humbled. And um, so if they were going to have a chance to rebuild, alliances seemed like a really good idea. And in order to make an alliance, you have to show, a, uh, um, you have to um, give shows of good faith and good trust. So mm. uh, from a historical point of view, what Hezekiah was trying to do was establish good working relationships with other countries that had an invested interest in resisting Assyrian dominance. Mm -hmm. It yes, wasn't God. smart. It wasn't smart, but it made Makes sense from a human standpoint. From a human standpoint, yes. because God then told Hezekiah, He said, "These men in Babylon are going to have all of this. They're going to take yeah. all of this." And yet, yeah. he didn't seem all that worried about it. He's like, "Well, I'll have <laughs> peace but, in my life." He was so tired. <laughs> well, imagine, like that's such a burden for him to have yeah. to bear as king of king of Judah. He had already seen thousands of his people slaughtered. Yeah. He was like well, he just yeah, he just wanted Judah, to right. he wanted to yeah. get he wanted to get to the end of his life in peace. <laughs> Overall, you know, he was a I good get man. it. Overall, I get it. You know, he was. He was a, <laughs> I get it, as a guy. And I mean, <laughs> you know, and his dad, right? His dad was not a good guy. No, no. exactly. Which is kind of what I 
was going to point out today mm -hmm. in, in what I studied in this chapter, because we see Isaiah and we know through your teaching today that, that Hezekiah was told through Isaiah that he was going to die. Mm -hmm. And Hezekiah wept to the Lord and said, Lord, I, I just want to remind you of some of the good things that I've done. And, 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 you know, can, can you extend my life? And, and we know that the end is that God did extend his life and God showed him a sign. Isaiah said, here's the sign that God has spoken, but it reminded me of his father Ahaz. If you go back into chapter seven of, of Isaiah, Isaiah is sent to Ahaz and he asks and says that God will give him a sign. And Ahaz is like, nah, you know, I don't really need a sign. I don't test God. And it almost sounds like he's being this great person person, but really he had already made alliances and was trusting in the, the other nations, mm -hmm. uh, probably with Assyria, that he was, he was putting himself in alignment with them. And so it really shows this contrast between father and son, where Ahaz trusted in the nations, where Hezekiah really trusted in God. Mm -hmm. And I think to myself, you know what, um, if, what if our lives what if our lives were written in here? It's very easy to judge the people and their decisions here when we can see it in black and white and say, oh my goodness, I never wouldn't have done that. But thank you for pointing that out today <laughs> because it's very true. And something else that you can also point out for us is the offer right, that we yes. have this month, which coordinates with the book of Isaiah. It does. So our offer for this month is called Introduction to Isaiah. And what we've done is we've put together an introduction to Isaiah for you. And what it is, is uh, it's about an hour and 10 minutes long. Uh, the first half of it is a teaching put together by myself, giving you the historical background to the book of Isaiah, setting you up uh, to win, to, uh, to, to, to understand uh, the book of Isaiah as you read it for yourself and study it for yourself. And and the, the last half of the DVD uh, is a, a roundtable discussion with this cast of Quick Study, really focusing in on discussion points about some of the prophecies of Isaiah. So if you would like to get a hold of your copy of Introduction to Isaiah, we're offering it for a $25 donation this month. And remember that Jesus Christ is real and Jesus Christ has said to us, he died on the cross and he rose again. And he said, if you come to me, all you who are heavy laden, I will give you rest. And if you need rest today, if you need to know that God loves you, if you need a problem dealt with and you've got to bring God into your life, then pray. Pray and just talk to God and say, God, come into my life. Jesus Christ, come into my life and set me free.